I would request our chairperson to invite and introduce the speaker of today's oration. Good evening, everybody. It's my proud privilege to welcome Professor Vaya Yadav, who is the chief guest of today's function also, to the stage. Professor Yadav completed his MBBS and MS general surgery from SMS Medical College, Jaipur. After that, he completed his MCH in Neurosurgery from PGI Chandigarh. After completing his studies, he shifted to NSCB Jabalpur Medical College in 1992, and he established the Department of Neurosurgery in the Medical College. He started the one new uh, neuroendoscopic training fellowship in 2000 and. 10. National and international delegates, he has trained about more than 650 until now. He started MCH in neurosurgery in 2017 in Jabalpur. He has been a great teacher and of many, for many of the young neurosurgeons, he was MCH examiner in many of the universities, but at least six universities, including BHU, Nizam Hyderabad, Rajasthan, and Mahatma Gandhi University of Jaipur, he has been examiners. He has a very vast administrative experience. He is presently the president of Neurological Society of India, 2022 to 2023. He is the president Neuroendoscopic Society of India in 2018 to 19. He is director government super specialty hospital in NSAB Jabalpur since August 2018. He started first government super specialty hospital in Madhya Pradesh in Jabalpur. He was president MP Association of Neurosciences from 2007 to 8. He is executive committee member and chairman of Young Neurosurgeon Committee of Neurological Society of India. He is working as professor and head neurosurgery department in Jabalpur since 2013. He was vice president MP Association of Neurosciences from 2006 to 7. He, is vice, he was Vice President Neuroendoscopy Society of India from 17 to 18. Professor Yadav has been blessed with great organization skills. He has started one week fellowship training program on Neuroendoscopy of India for first time in 2010. And he is running that program successfully till now. He has organized 24 conferences, workshops, as secretary and chairman of the organizing committees. He has organized 11 prestigious orations as chairman in the same, in the name of famous teachers of leading neurosurgeons. He is, he is organizer of Innovation Bazaar on 14 May 2016 in Jabalpur Middle College. He has organized mega, melt, mega health camps. He has got many publications and written books in journals. He is editor of Neuroendoscopic Surgery, a Comprehensive Approach. He is co-editor of Neurology India. His publications, 154 publications in scientific journals, 38 chapters in books, 80 publications on neuroendoscopy, and he, was, he, has, he has been a part of many international trials, <coughs> crash trial, crash two trial, and brain trial. The best part is that he is a very innovative neurosurgeon and he has innovated many uh, instruments for neurosurgery. One of the most famous is this tubular brain retractor, which is being used by many neurosurgeons in the minimally invasive surgeries. He has mod uh, innovated a modified brain retractor for deep-seated lesions and chronic subdural hematomas. He has developed inexpensive models for training and endoscopy. He has developed many innovative techniques for surgical modalities for the neurosurgeons. He has, he's a talented person, has received many awards, Cherak Award, the highest medical award by state IMA in 2011. He invi invited as a writing committee member in crash trial. He was appointed as external export, expert for board of studies in neurosciences. And the best part is that he is a very simple and humble person. 
and he is famous in the neurosurgical fraternity for his gratitude and humility. I welcome Professor Yadav on the stage and to deliver his oration. Thank you. Thank you for kind words. Uh, and I am <coughs> thankful to his Rukarnar. Thank you very much uh, for nice introduction. Today I will be discussing the overview of uh, neuroendoscopy, recent indications and uh, in CNS diseases. Uh, before I start my uh, oration, I like to salute uh, Professor V. K. Agarwal sir for his contribution in medicine and pediatric in particular. Uh, we are all grateful and, and therefore we are here for this oration. Uh, Regarding the neuroendoscopy, uh, the endoscopy has many advantages, including better visualization. There are many surgical indications now as standalone or as an adjuvant, uh, um, uh, as far as the CNS disease are concerned. But there are also limitations. So. Any surgeon or anyone, I think what is more important is don't look at the advantages only. There are limitations and if you can overcome limitations, then you can progress. So today I'll discuss the indications and limitations. Obviously, I'll not go into the detail of how surgery is done. Uh, also, I'll discuss uh, how I overcome some of the limitations in the endo endoscopic surgery and I'll try to give some message to our young colleague that uh, from my experience that how one should go. Regarding the indications in endoscopic surgery, for me there are a lot of indications uh, of endoscopic surgery and some of them are uh, hydrocephalus, lumbar disc, cervical disc surgery, the cervical compressive myelopathy, uh, posterior approach, uh, and I can decompress up to six level uh, from endoscopic uh, technique only, or anterior approach when there are multiple three segment disease uh, doing a partial corpectomy. Uh, for intraventricular bleed also with obstructive hydrocephalus, uh, I do endoscopic surgery, hypertensive bleed also, and intraventricular tumor or deep-seated uh, tumors, colloid cyst, and for pituitary tumors, craniopharyngiomas, meningiomas, uh, trigeminal neuralgias, hemifacial spasm, CSF rhinorrhea, uh, uh, the uh, spinal tumors, chronic subdural hematoma, AAD, using trans-oral or trans-cervical approach, the foramen magnum decompression, and so on, CPN lesions, the list is endless. Uh, regarding the indications, um, uh, the endoscopy, we all know that it allows better visualization. This is a minimally invasive technique, uh, reduces hospital stay, there is a lower cost, and this is good for uh, education. But there are limitations which I'll discuss in the later part and how to overcome them. Uh, the endoscopic view, as we all know, that it provides panoramic view as against only limited view by the microscope because it allows visualization in the corner. So this you can take as the uh, example for a layman that you, you get a panoramic view in the endoscope compared to microscope. Uh, one of the indication, common indications uh, is the lumbar disc surgery. So I'll be discussing only a uh, few of them. Obviously, all of them cannot be covered. Uh, lumbar disc uh, surgeries are uh, quite common, but majority of them obviously can be managed by conservative approach. 
surgery is indicated when the conservative treatment fails or there is a progressive neurodeficit. It can be done when you have either unilateral symptoms or bilateral symptoms at single level or multiple level. You, it can be done even if there is a highly migrated disc uh, in lateral, central, or extrafemoral disc, recurrent disc, even calcified or fibrous disc or disc at any level, including L1, L2, to L5, S1, and even LCS. Uh, but for unstable spine and uh, lesions for more than three level, I don't do endoscopic surgery because it takes more time, although it can be done. Uh, so this is the video showing the disc, the lamina. Only part of the lamina on one side has been removed. And if there are multiple, I mean, the other side symptoms, you can go undercut the opposite lamina. This is the disc fragment which is coming out. And I think for the uh, uh, time constraint, I skip. The other indications uh, is the cervical disc uh, surgery. This is known as disc preserving surgery. So we all know that um, we talk of uh, functional thing and uh, we should preserve motion. So in endoscopy only part of the disc can be removed and majority of the normal disc can be left. Uh, uh, th this is indicated when there is anti-compression, whether it is radiculopathy, that means the root is involved, or even the cord is involved because of the disc, or the osteophyte, or the posterior longitudinal ligament. Again, up to two level uh, with the single approach, it can be done. Uh, but there are contraindications if the compression is from the posterior side, congenital canal stenosis, or there is a, a reduced disc height with foraminal stenosis. The advantages of endoscopic techniques are that it preserves most of the normal disc. So you don't have to take out the normal disc, which is not culprit. So only a part of the disc is herniating, and that need to be removed. Uh, and that is the principle of endoscopic surgery. The fusion is not required. It preserves the motion segment. And uh, there is no manipulation of the root or the cord uh, because the compression is lying anteriorly. Uh, this is the example. Preoperative, you see on the right side, C6, C7 disc was there. This is the post-operative uh, picture. And you can realize that very small, uh, very small uh, portion of the bone the disc is removed. So only a small portion is removed, majority of the disc and adjoining bone uh, is left intact. The other indication is uh, chronic subdural hematoma. We know that uh, the chronic uh, subdural hematoma usually occur in elderly and there are situations when a simple bar hole does not do good. I mean, there are lesions which, which cannot be operated by simple bar hole, all the, although the indications are around 15 to 20%. And what are these uh, cases when you have an organized clot, that is solid, solid clot, which does not come out through the bar hole, or there are multiple septas, there are bridging vessels inside the cavity, so if you do blind irrigation, it may bleed. There may be synechia or there may be thick vascular uh, wall. So in such cases, simple bar hole does not work. Therefore, you have to go for large craniotomy, which may not be ideal for elderly patient. This also prevents the bleeding from the bridging vessels when you do blind irrigation, because before surgery, unless you do a good quality MRI, you will not know that in the, in the cavity there are some bridging vessels uh, which is coming. Uh, it gives rise to higher percentage of the hematoma removal and it allows better visualization of the whole hematoma cavity. Uh, so this is the hematoma cavity, the endoscope, and 
again I innovated one more retractor that is novel modified uh, brain retractor which retracts the the cavity and therefore it allows the posterior hematoma cavity to be visualized uh, very gently and the whole hematoma uh, can be removed. Uh, so this is the modified retractor. There are problems, there were problems in uh, endoscopic surgery of the chronic subdural hematoma. So when you come across problem, you should try to find out solution. This is what I believed in whole of my career. And the difficulty was that there was rapid re-expansion of the hematoma. When you remove half of the hematoma, uh, the brain bulges, so there is hardly any space. You need to have retraction to do endoscopic surgery. There are cases when the cavity itself is small in young patient and there is difficulty in visualization of the whole hematoma cavity. So in those cases, I uh, started using this modified uh, retractor which is tapered. So the tubular retractor which I devised for deep-seated lesions, I cut it into two half, which is silicone tube only, and then tapered it for ease of introduction and used these three uh, silk so that it does not migrate. The other indications is endoscopic surgery. It is quite useful in hydrocephalus cases. It allows CSF to flow directly from the third ventricle to the basal cistern and therefore it avoids the site of obstruction and it prevents shunt placement which obviously require uh, repeated shunt revision especially in children. So this is especially useful in obstructive hydrocephalus but not so good in post hemorrhagic and post infective in acute phase. But in chronic cases the results are excellent. Uh, the indications are many. Uh, this is a short video. The congenital aqueductal stenosis is the uh, most ideal in chronic phase of TBM. Also, you can do in other infection, chronic phase, and in the tumor of the posterior third ventricle or the posterior fossa, or when there is a shunt malfunction, then also you can go for surgery. Uh, I think uh, we can fast forward this. This is the surgery. These are two mammillary bodies. This is the basilar artery, the clivus, and the trans translucent place in front of the bas basilar artery. So you make an opening in the third ventricle floor, and then you dilate this. Uh, and by doing this, you see that there is good pulsation in the floor, which indicate that uh, the stoma is functioning well. This is the basilar artery, which is seen uh, after surgery, which shows successful ETV. Now, the other indications are hypertensive bleed. Uh, and uh, these are quite uh, difficult cases, although the role of surgery in uh, these deep-seated intracerebral hematoma is controversial. But the recent uh, uh, reports using minimally invasive technique uh, are showing benefits of surgery. And uh, we also had uh, one, one of the largest series in the world uh, doing endoscopic surgery and we found that the results are encouraging, although uh, two high-quality randomized trials fail to show any benefit of surgery or conservative treatment, but there were limitations because these were uh, open surgery, not the minimally invasive surgery. Uh, there was high crossover from medical arm to the surgical arm, and um, uh, there was trend toward the good results in a subgroup. So in some cases, there was uh, better results, but it was not statistically significant. And there were mixing of patients from those 
there were patients who were benefited from surgery and there were patients who were actually harmed. So those patients, if you remove, that is the patient in poor GCS from 3 to 8, uh, this has been found in the sub-analysis that the patient with GCS of 3 uh, from 10 to 13 uh, were found to have a better prognosis and possibly because there were less number of patients, so the statistical significance did not come. But there was a trend toward better results in surgical arm. These are the various endoscopic series in the world. And you can see here that uh, ours is the, uh, I mean, we recruited way back in 18, uh, 270 patients. Uh, the indication of surgery are uh, only few uh, when the hematoma is 30 cc or more with GCS of 8 to 13. So not in a very poor GCS, we don't operate. Large hematoma reaching the surface, cerebellar hematomas, uh, more than 3 centimeter. But the contraindications are when the hematoma is small, uh, involving the brain stem or the patient having a poor GCS of 3 to 7. Uh, this is short video. Why uh, uh, there were problems in the endoscopic surgery for visualization of the clot uh, and therefore uh, we tried to take some help and this was the tubular retractor, although some of the tubular retractors were available in the world literature, but they were very costly and I was working in medical college uh, setup and we could not afford this, these uh, high costly tubular retractor. So I invented this uh, silicone tube. I cut it, uh, in fact, longitudinally cut this so that you can introduce it through the small opening. And this I consider as one of the best tubular retractor available with almost no cost. Uh, regarding the pituitary tumor surgery, transspinoid surgery, we know there are many indications. Uh, most of the pit pituitary tumors can be operated through the nose using endoscopy. But there are limitations if there is a lateral extension, if there is a brain invasion, if the tumor is very firm, or if there are involvement of the artery, kissing carotid, or involvement of the optic apparatus. In such case, uh, surgery becomes difficult. So again, for want of time, I fast forward this. And uh, this is the drilling of the cella. And after that, uh, we make a nick in the dura and take out the tumor until there is an arachnoid bulge which, which is uniform. So that becomes the end point. And then you put in the fat and the naso nasoceptral flap. Uh, so what is more important is the limitations. The, and this is where uh, we should all work. So there are limitations and you have to learn how to overcome those limitations to do a good endoscopic surgery. So the limitations of endoscopy is the blind area which I'll discuss in next slide. Control of bleeding, there's a limited space, uh, so therefore there's a difficulty in bimanual dissection. There may be poor visualization in some cases, and it requires completely different skill, just opposite to the microscope, and therefore if we apply microscopic uh, tech, uh, skills in endoscope, you may fail. There may be, uh, there is a 2D image and there's a steep learning curve which you have to overcome. So this is one of the uh, problem I encountered and I found the solution and we published. So the problem in endoscopy is that if you place endoscope at one place, 
and then if you work in a in a straight line uh, this is a corpectomy median uh, the partial corpectomy so you have to work in a straight line and if you put in two instruments which are required some time uh, if there is a bleeding and you have to do drilling so if you want to put in a suction and the drill then the distal instrument will not be visualized because the suction is coming in the way. So this is the limitation of endoscopic surgery. So what uh, we did uh, that I put the uh, distal instrument first, that is suction first, under vision. And then I kept this suction at that level and uh, you can find out that the, and keep this suction at that particular depth which you can make out if, if the suction uh, comes little bit back towards you, then there will be pulling of the blood. And if you go a little bit deep, then you press onto the dura. So you put in suction there, keep it at that depth, and then you bring in drill. So uh, you can use two instruments in the straight line, and still you can work. So this is the new surgical technique which we described and therefore we could continue to do our uh, partial corpectomy. The other problem which we came across in the channel endoscopic surgery, especially uh, our patients come with very vascular big tumor uh, and these are difficult with conventional endoscopic surgery. Uh, that is the channel endoscopic surgery the instruments are passed through the working channel, so there is a difficulty in doing bimanual dissection. There is a difficulty in control of bleeding. Therefore, this channel endoscope is ideal for very small and avascular lesions, which are very few. So, but when you combine endoscopy with the tubular retractor, uh, then you can overcome all those limitations, and now we can operate almost all Anything which can be done with the microscope can also be done with the endoscope in our setup. Uh, so this is the tubular retractor which we invented and it has two unique quality which is not there in any of the retractor uh, and one is the longitudinal cut. So this is a soft silicone tube and if you make a uh, longitudinal cut in fact, this was suggested by my wife because I was struggling in putting this tube inside the brain and she came in the OT. She said, what are you doing? I was struggling, squeezing the tube and trying to put it inside. Uh, I said, I'm trying to put this inside. She said, just put in a longitudinal cut on this tube, fold it and, and then put it inside. So this longitudinal cut allows us to fold this tube which goes through the small opening. And then this longitudinal cut also allows us, uh, when there is a high brain uh, pressure, then it, the tube collapses rather than it causes compression on the brain. And it is a soft use tube because it is thin and it is uh, of silicone, so it does not cause any uh, damage to the brain. I have discussed that there were problems in chronic subdural hematoma, in visualization of the whole hematoma cavity and retraction of the brain and therefore we, we uh, uh, devised this modified, the same tubular retractor, I cut it into two half and then I tapered it. This tube was going inside and coming out with each introduction of instrument or endoscope. So then I started applying the sutures uh, which prevents migration of this tube. And the other limitation of endoscopic surgery is the learning curve. It's difficult to learn endoscopic surgery and unfortunately the learning endoscopy is difficult because the models which are available for learning are very limited and they are again very costly. And the other learning could be cadaver. Again, these are not available. So what we thought with the help of Dr. Jitin Bajaj, you have already heard, we devise a simple 
inexpensive model in which all techniques of endoscopy can be learned and there is no cost involved. You can do it in, in your chamber itself. So the message for young colleague is nothing is impossible. The difficulties which you face should be taken as opportunity and these usually help in innovations and I choose neuroendoscopic surgery because nobody was doing that time. Most of the people were not doing so comparatively new specialty you should choose. Uh, therefore, you can get early recognition. And uh, the other complaint uh, I have trained, uh, not 650, this was an old slide. Uh, we have trained 850 uh, endoscopic neurosurgeons so far. And most of these uh, young neurosurgeons, they come and either they say that uh, my boss is not allowing or the instruments are not available. So I tell them, do whatever is possible in your setup. At least you can do head injuries. Then you can start doing tumors. The, the cost of instrument is uh, minimum. You can purchase yourself. So don't purchase car, but you should purchase instruments. And then uh, I believe that 90% people are good. They will come. If you show your work, they will come for your help and then from no facilities in Jabalpur when I came to now the most advanced uh, facilities we have and we are running a very popular neuroendoscopy fellowship training program uh, every six monthly and uh, when we open this fellowship program in just 15 days period all 50 seats are full. And we also have a university certified fellowship training program there, which is the only endoscopic training program in India. And our center is recognized by the World Federation of Neurosurgery uh, for training, postgraduate training. So what I want to say is that um, uh, if you want to do something, uh, I think uh, you can do it. Uh, but you have to have uh, the help of colleagues, so you have to keep your behavior uh, I mean, good. Most neurosurgeons uh, are not good in this, unfortunately. Uh, difficulties should be taken as opportunity, I said. So we innovated the tubular retractor. Uh, we have described a new surgical technique and novel uh, retractor plus some new uh, <coughs> new uh, endoscopic technique and uh, describe how to develop super specialty. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yadav, for giving such a lucid uh, talk on uh, endoscopy in uh, uh, this uh, neurosurgery. See, we as a ENT surgeon had always, we have been using this uh, endoscopes for a very uh, long time and I just tell you, I just share with you my experience. See, we do a lot of autologic surgery with microscope and again we started, we wanted to change from autologic to, from micro to uh, endoscopic surgery. So visualization with endoscope is excellent and it, it is not compared. The only disadvantage is that your one hand is holding the endoscope and another hand is free for doing surgery. Whereas in microscope you are doing, you are using both your hands. So it becomes one hand is using suction and another you are operating. It becomes easier. But now with the advent of uh, this uh, certain uh, devices which hold the endoscopes, the endoscope holders have come up. And now in ENT, a lot of people have switched from microscopic ear surgery to endoscopic ear, ear surgery and they are becoming popular. And we are always uh, collaborate with our neurosurgeons in transnasal anterior skull based approaches and every conference when we go, we see that the indications are widening. The endoscopic approaches we were uh, thinking of only pituitary, but a lot of supracellular tumor and paracellular tumor and tumors lateral to the cavernous sinus, uh, they are all uh, being uh, removed 
uh, with the help of the endoscopes. So I will take this opportunity to, uh, one is pay my sincere tribute to uh, uh, our legendary uh, teacher who, uh, with uh, whom name we have all accumulated. Another person I want to remember at this stage is, all of you must be knowing one uh, physicist from Agra who invented the fiber optic endoscopes, Mr. Uh, Kopni. He was a uh, Sikh from Punjab and he studied in Agra University. And from there he went to UK and then to America. And he was, it was not the Hopkins, Hopkins telescopes which we usually say, but it was Hopkins, he initially started, but the bent, the bending which is, that was only a straight telescope. The bent which was given in that telescope and the development of fiber, fiber technology, fiber optic technology, where you can bend, bend the tip of the uh, endoscope that was invented by uh, Mr. Kopney and he was supposed to get Nobel Prize but somehow he could not uh, get it but uh, he died in uh, 2021. In 2000, uh, sorry, 2020, in 21 he was posthumously given um, by the Indian government this uh, uh, award, Padma Bibhushan Award was given. So I, I think at this occasion we should all remember him and uh, we need uh, more professors like uh, our uh, Professor Yadav for propagating this uh, endoscopic technique and using, I think, more uh, fiber optic, flexible fiber optic uh, devices also that will make it easier for going into your foramen of Munaro and all, all these things. So with this, I thank uh, 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 Professor Yadav for such a lucid talk. Thank you, sir.